Greetings, everyone. I am Matt Tatiana. Welcome back to this beautiful channel, all about vibrations and helping you to rise up. Okay, so I am here today with such a special, beautiful, collaborative guest of mine. Um, in fact, she's not going to be a guest. We are collaborative buddies moving forward, and she is an angel to say the least. Um, so for those that don't know, I am a brain education numerologist, the study of the mind, body, and spirit. I help to support you in your health and well-being journey. Okay, so I am going to bring her along. So it's going to be her and myself. And um, today the topic is going to be about numbers, numerology, and these vibrations, and how are we being placed in the Board of Ed. Yes, so the Board of Education we're going to talk about today. So we're going to take numerology to a whole nother level and really understanding how we're moving day to day. So I'm going to bring her out here for we can have a beautiful you guys can see her you see her she's so beautiful right yay so um she, her name is Nefrakara, and i would like her to just take this the the spot right now to introduce herself okay hatab family peace and love it's such a a real privilege to be here and i thank you master tatiana for having me on um i am a holistic um, empowerment life coach. My background is a licensed clinical social worker. I was a school social worker in the New York City public school system for almost 30 years. I have also been trained um, clinically in NLP, in hypnotherapy, play therapy, and a diversity of other, um, as well as family constellations. I've also had a diversity of holistic trainings in terms of naturopathic, in terms of um, aromatherapy, crystal work, um, energy healing through pranic, reiki, and um, polarity. Um, I have trained in those for over 40 years because I've always been aware that we're not just our minds. There is a interrelationship between our minds, our body, and our spirits, and that it's important to work with children, families, couples, people as a whole versus in parts because we all are a whole entity. Now. Why it's so important to understand these things because we are also being put in certain places that we don't really know why, right? So now we have someone here that not only has this, this wisdom, but has also the experience to share, right? So I would like for her, for Nefra Karat to come here and share a little bit of the Board of Ed, Special Ed, we are going to call it something different here, right? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, to clarify yeah. it better, um, as I, um, in this, in the Board of Ed, my focus was primarily on children who had been classified as special education. And I used to explain to them all the time because they would feel that it implied that they were stupid, something was wrong with them, that they were going to be failures, that they could not succeed. And I would explain to them that special ed actually means specialized learning, that, you know, one size doesn't fit everybody, and that in the general class is a generic way of teaching, and it doesn't mean that, it, that you can't learn, but that is a, you learn in a different way. Years ago, um, back in the um, early to mid-80s, there were some studies done on learning styles. And it was established that there were various ways that people learn. Some are visual learners where they have to see it and visualize it to comprehend. Some are more audio where they listen, you know, they hear it more. Some are more um, hands-on kinet you know, kinesthetics where they have to touch and feel. And that um, some are more linear. In the studies, it showed that Asians and white males tend to learn better linearly and verbally, where the teacher, when you have on the general board with the one, two, three, A, B, C, U, and me yes. talking, that they they really excel that way. Mm. It showed that um, females can learn that way, um, but they're also kind of visual and sometimes audio. And again, it's it's on an average because 
you have different people, you know, individually that they may have these different traits, but they're just saying that um, in general, the average, that's how it plays out. For boys of color, they tend to be experiential. They do better with like field trips, um, projects where the hands on touching, mm. you know, when you see it like on a movie where you can really kind of, you know, experience it with all of your senses. So at the time, I figured, oh, great. So now they're going to fine-tune the curriculum to address their strengths. But that's when I began to notice that, no, they were accentuating their weaknesses and then saying, there's something wrong with you, so we got to, you know, give you extra help. And as their, as their social worker, you know, to help keep their sense of self-esteem together while they're being labeled as, quote, damaged goods. The other piece is that a lot of um, our children, particularly the boys, are what's um, on the spectrum of dyslexia. Mm -hmm. Some people know it as reversal of letters and what have you, but it's also at times a confusion of thought when you're trying to read in a book. Um, and there's particular formats of books that are more dyslexia friendly depending on where on the spectrum you are than others. And of course, the textbooks in the Board of Ed do not accommodate that. They don't even test for that in the system because then they would be held responsible, at least that's how it was explained to me years ago. So once again, you know, it's again blaming the, 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 the child. Instead of saying, we don't have the resources, we're not equipped to teach you correctly, yeah. it's reverse, it's dyslexic saying, there's something wrong with you that you can't learn. <laughs> the fact that you can't learn the way we're teaching, which is a very different message, a very different. Because I used to explain to parents, I said, that's like if you were in Russia and you don't know Russian, and you're in a classroom and they're teaching in Russian. Is it that you cannot learn or you can't learn in Russian because you don't know Russian? It's the same concept with our children. If you're in a class and they're teaching to your weaknesses, or not teaching to you at all, they're teaching at you. And then when they switch to the core curriculum, that just exacerbated it. Because then it was like all children and the teachers are left behind. Because now you have a case where it's been homogenized. When I would go to observe children in their classrooms that were being assessed for special ed, Mm -hmm. I was I was amazed, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, if I was sitting in a class for an hour, there was basically one subject, and the teacher was able to engage and get a sense of, you know, who got the concept, who didn't, who's going to need extra help. Now, it was like they were on this, this time clock. Every 20 minutes, okay, different topic, different topic, and I'm looking at just like, what the heck is going on here? Oh, no, with the core curriculum, at 8 o'clock to like 8.20, everybody in the grade has to be teaching this subject this way. Doesn't matter if the, doesn't, the children don't get it. Doesn't matter if even, the, you know, doesn't matter. 20 minutes later, we got to move, we got to move, we got to move. Mm -hmm. And everything was now towards these tests because everything now is about data instead about what school was supposed to be, which is educating our children, engaging our children and helping them to develop themselves, those the basic skills. I found out they don't even teach cursive writing anymore. No, they don't. And it's like, and why is that? Why is that? I said, aren't our children supposed to be able to sign their name? How are they going to have a signature if they're not taught cursive writing? They're yeah. not. They're not also not taught the keyboard for the computers. So why everything's computerized? Well, you're not teaching them the computer board either. I found that out because back in the old days. When I was going to school 100 years ago, you know, for the type old-fashioned <laughs> typewriters, you learned the keyboard. Yeah. I found out that my students weren't even being taught that because as I was talking to one of them one time, I'm typing. When you learn the keyboard, you don't have to look at it while you're typing because you just know what it is. And they said, how are you doing that and not watching it? So I explained, well, when you, and he's, and I said, they don't, they're not, so they're not teaching you cursive writing, but they're not teaching you the keyboard. Everybody just uses two fingers and yet they just got real fast at it and hunt, hunt and peck. So a lot of this, which is why I was fascinated with the numerology part, is that as we were discussing it, you know, it's like, yes, 
numerology is a nice tool mm -hmm. to help our parents as well as our children to get in touch with themselves to see why is it that I um, do better absorbing things by looking at it? Mm -hmm. Why is it that I'm more experiential? Why is it that these, you know, these topics, you know, are attracted to me this way, not the other way? Um, the other aspect of it also has to do with the curriculum itself. When you're being taught a history that is totally inact, basically lies, mm. that teaches you that Africa, Africa is the only, Africa is the only country that, I mean, the, yeah, the only, they even call it a country, not a continent, but the only people who have contributed nothing to civilization, nothing. Mm. When in reality, it was the cradle of civilization. But when you're trying to train a child's mind into feeling that they were nothing, if you tell them you've come from nothing, then it's hard for them to perceive themselves as doing something. You know, everybody else is giving credit for what we did. You know, I would travel to to Africa to um, different countries in Africa, mm -hmm. so I could bring back pictures and show them this is what it really looks like. Uh, this is really our history. The, you know, the oppressed Jews did not build the pyramids. We built the pyramids. They, their their mud and straw ones must have washed away a long time ago. <laughs> These are made from granite. We made mm -hmm. granite ones. Uh, the original people in medicine was Imhotep, not Hippoc Hippocratic Hipp Hippocrates, or whatever you want to call him. Mm -hmm. And what was fascinating to me was that when I would sit there and teach them our true history, the most acting out child would sit there and ask questions. And when it was time to go home, instead of saying, when I get to go, when I get to go, it's like, what do you mean it's time to go? Yeah, I'm learning about myself. I would have children who are acting out in class and acting ridiculous before yeah. Obama was president. And they would talk, he said, well, you know, no, my ancestors were ever president. So that's right, they weren't. And I said, don't worry about this puny little country with some presidents. I said, your ancestors mm. were rulers. They were kings and queens. They were rulers. They were the doctors, lawyers, and Indian chiefs in Africa, in the continent of Africa, with all the countries there. I said, and this puny little place would fit in t inside of where you were. And they did it way before this country ever. And the little child looked at me and goes, you mean I come from royalty? I wow. said, yes. He shifted in his seat. He sat up. He said, well, then I can't be acting like this. I'm somebody. I've come from somebody, right? And anytime he'd see me, he goes, right, right? I'm somebody. Wow. And that's what I mean is that we need to do, we need to learn more about our true stories. No, we do. We need to know thyself. And even with the numerology, it started from our culture. Other cultures like to take credit. But if you look at the, the, the temple walls and what they now call Egypt, which was originally called Kemet, mm -hmm. the black land with the black people. Yes. You will see that it also originated from us. Mm. Because the numbers and everything, as you know, is from vibrations and frequencies. Yes. And that everything that it was based on in that system had to do with that. We have been disconnected by being... Um, miseducated see. by be, by using the different techniques that don't serve us. Mm -hmm. If you go back to original, original tribes in Africa, the way that we were taught then, the mythology that was used there, because even, even um, educators that are more conscious mm -hmm. and have learned the ways that we learn, will show you that, yes, if you teach our children this way versus the ways that are taught, not only do they learn it, mm -hmm. they take it to a whole other level. Oh, yeah. They're much more in alignment. They're much more in alignment where their frequency, their vibration. I like to say that, you know, I like to believe and know that um, those before us knew how to put us, what, where to play us, where to place us at according to these frequencies and these vibrations. So even when I talk to anyone regarding their numbers, I tell them, 
don't get too lost in the numbers, right? Oh, it's a number, it's a number. No, it's these numbers are representations of, of vibrations and frequencies, right? Um, and our elders and our ancestors, they knew, they knew, like they, they were able to, I know there used to be even stories of like when we were born, like you weren't, your parents just didn't just give you any name. Like, okay, this is your name. It was really a sacred time that it, it was chosen according to like your birthday, the time you were born, the place you were born. And it, it was revealing so much about your destiny, your lessons. It was revealing a lot of even the things you were going to have to overcome, right? So your parents had a synopsis of, of your journey already. So they knew how to guide you in the world. So it was less like blind leading the blind, right? right? So it was more like, okay, well... I know this is what the child is going to be all about. <laughs> so this is where I need to place the child at. This is how I'm going to have to support the child. And I have to be okay with letting this child leave, right? Because if I know the child has a vibration of one, whether it's in the life path or the soul's urge or the personality, whichever core placement it is, I know that as a leader, this child is going to eventually like shake shake things up to escape to leave so i know okay well it's time for me to let this child develop their independence their ability to to um to grow right to lead and to cultivate so i i love everything that you're saying because when it comes to the board of ed i think that we are all placed in in just one category most of the time, and this is the struggle that we all have, that even our parents doubt their ability to guide us. Right. Right? Well, they, even the, the way they had, or even the way they had been guided, because they were misguided through the same system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I think it's, you know, even for myself, having a life path five, and my numbers are a, little, a bit interesting, very strong. But you guys know I'm an open book, so I always like to share my truth, right? Um, I was placed in the special ed system. Mm -hmm. I was placed in the special ed system when I was in my last year of junior high. And um, I didn't know. I didn't know why I was so upset. In fact, I didn't know. I knew I struggled with reading. I knew I struggled with um yeah, I would like to say, like, reading, I struggle with that really, really hard, at least in the beginning stages of school, of being in the Board of Ed. Um, I like to believe I'm still learning <laughs> how to read. I don't even have to build that confidence with reading. But I was placed in special ed, and that, that's what they call it, the special ed system. And, of course, I had an issue with that because I was in this goody two-shoe school for a long time. And I was fortunate to have nice, like, good friends that I was able to, like, copy off of them, you know, things like that. I was always good, though, with numbers. Numbers, you gave me numbers. I was very quick. I was able to calculate. And I was also good with art and craft. But didn't understand why I had so much hardship with reading, why I couldn't see the letters. And so people would tell me, oh, it's because you're not from here. You know, they will tell me that, oh, you're not from here or you're, you know, for those that don't know, I, I come from an, an indigenous culture. I'm Garifuna, right? Um, and so happened to be, I was born in Honduras. So Garifuna people are all over Central America and in the Caribbean as well. And I was told because I spoke another tongue, which I unfortunately do not know how to speak fluently which I wish, wish I did, um, but I struggled a lot. I struggled a lot. And even going into the special ed system, I went there with, with big judgments and already feeling like I wasn't good enough. I wasn't smart, and that's why I was here. I was being punished. <laughs> I was like, even the work that was being provided. Yeah, like there's something wrong with you versus the way. Because that's been the other challenge is that, 
even with the English as a second language program, they don't acknowledge certain countries. Mm. Like, for example, even though Jamaica is technically an English speaking language, it's British based and British English is very different than American English. Mm -hmm. So they don't qualify for ESL. And a lot of my students that came from there or came from, you know, Honduras or other places, it's like, um, well, you know, you're English speaking, even though the dialect is different. The wording, the, the, the vocabulary is different. So a lot of the children that were doing well in the Caribbean started failing when they came here. And I would tell them there needs to be an aspect of ESL for these children because it's a different form of English. So what you're saying wow. is very accurate because if you are learning, because like, for example, I learned Spanish when I became a bilingual um, social worker. Mm -hmm. I learned Castilian Spanish because when you go to school for it, you yeah. learn Spanish from Spain. Mm -hmm. That's very different than the dialect you, you speak in Puerto Rico, mm. which is different to the Spanish you learn in Mexico, which is different than the Spanish you learn in the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. So when I started in the school system, my, my students from different places became my maestritos. Because they would say, you know, like, I learned, okay, autobus. Mm -hmm. I had some parent my first day in the school as the bilingual counselor coming in talking about some guagua. And well, well who's that? Ah, that yes, is what? that the, is that the kid that beat him up? Is <laughs> that the teacher's name? Like who's guagua? And we're playing charades, and I'm trying to figure out who they because in 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 school you learn autobus. Yeah, autobus is bus. Mm -hmm. So luckily, the, the bilingual special ed teacher, who I love daily after that, <laughs> rescued me because he came by and I was like, you, I'm not proud. And I was like, who is Guagua? And he left and he said, that's the school bus. I'm like, how do you get Guagua out of autobus? And my oh. student said, oh, because the school bus goes Guagua, 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 Guagua. Uh -huh. That's <laughs> So they had to teach me all the idioms for that. Now, so, you know, when if I went to Puerto Rico or someplace, yeah, I know Spanish, but not that Spanish. Yeah. And it's not a matter of which one's better or worse, because people also try to qualify for yeah. to know the history. It's like, okay, during the enslavement period, when Spain and England and all of them came to the Caribbean and, and South America, Central America stuff, mm -hmm. and colonized it, it then became a blend of the original languages from those countries with the colonizers. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have, quote, funny Spanish, yes. you know, Creole, Patois, and all that. It's a blend of the two languages. Mm -hmm. So it's like a midpoint. So you come here with your blend, because even American English, you know, there are reasons why it's not the same as the British that originally came here. Yes, yes. And that's why this is purer in the Caribbean islands from the enslavement time that we're not taught about in school. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that there had been enslavement in the Caribbean part until I was an adult and learned it on my own. And wow. being from the Caribbean, at first I used to feel badly for my friends who were from the South, like, oh, well, their ancestors were from slaves. Mine weren't. Yes. I was so shocked. I was like in my mid to late thirties studying outside of the school system. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the public school system, up, you know, up in Westchester. Mm -hmm. I was like, how come they don't teach that part? They also don't teach you all the, the fact that slavery was also up here in the north. They don't teach you that either. It, you you know what? I I want to get to. I love how we just talked about like this the the language right now, because, and bringing it back to like vibrations. Right. Um, there was a time that you and I spoke and we I know that you 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 I, I think you you was sharing about these vibrations. Right. I was telling you about my native tongue, Garifuna, the dialect. Yes. Um, and you were talking about the frequencies. And then I shared with you about how I heard someone actually in the breakfast club. <laughs> I heard someone that was talking about um the proper way of like pronouncing like certain letters and how these the this form of pronouncing them right from our original language was would actually help um 
stimulate the brain and, and realign our vibration of the brain that allow us to absorb better, right? Um, and, and that's why I, I like that, that you're talking about the languages right now because, yes, you're right. I think languages play a major role on how we also receiving information. Yes. And most of us are taught immediately. As soon as you come to the United States, you have to learn English. If you want to survive, if you want to make it anywhere, you have to learn English. So we start to disconnect from our native language, our native tongue, and there, there has to be a little bit of balance. Yeah, we should learn English to navigate in this in this country that we're in, but we should not necessarily, in, in fact, we shouldn't. We should always keep our native tongue up there because we need it for the sake of the um, operation system of this right here. So I'd like for you to talk that, about that. Well, part of it is because it's, it's to keep in terms of how you resonate, but also your culture is connected to your language. Mm. And that's why there's this whole thing of forget, you know, like it's worthless because they know if you don't know your original language, mm-hmm. then you have a disconnect with your culture, your original culture. And when you are disconnected from your original culture, you no longer have a sense of yourself. And then you then begin to also feel less than because where you came from was nothing. Where you came from had no value. And so now you're subservient to the dominating culture that you're now trying to strive to acclimate to. You know, they always say, you know, it's, it's, this country is supposed to be a melting pot where all the different cultures complement each other and um, brings out the best. And then some say it's like a quilt where everybody keeps a little bit of what have you. But especially when it comes to um, communities of color, especially since so many of us were, you know, our ancestors were brought here as commodities, not humans, that by the time we were strip of our language, strip of our culture, strip of the decency of being human beings, till today, that's why they have this whole thing with the electoral um, the electoral group and what have you, because we were not even seen as fully human. That if you notice, even in the school system, going back to that again, we're taught the colonizers' language. All the European languages, we're not taught. We don't even. Most of us don't even know that Af- that the different countries of Africa have languages, and mm-hmm. have very developed languages that predated these languages, mm-hmm. and that they're learnable. I didn't know that you could even, I, I didn't even know there were all these languages because we're taught, well, they're uncivilized. They were just running around eating people half naked. Mm. Meanwhile, it's like, yeah, no, that didn't happen. And that, yes, you know, you've got Swahili, you've got um, Jolof, you've got Twa, you've got the, I mean, there is so many different languages mm-hmm. because Africa itself was colonized. French isn't an, an original language in Africa. No. But, but you can tell even in Africa by the language, the European language that they speak, mm-hmm. who their colonizers were. An English-speaking country was colonized by England. A French-speaking one, just like in the Caribbean, yes. was colonized by France. They talk whatever that language is, they're letting you know who the enslavers were. Mm-hmm. And then when the, Christian, the Christi- Christians came in with their um, schools, yeah. And the children sometimes were kidnapped or they, the parents were um, made to believe that this would be a better life for them. Mm-hmm. They were taken out of, the, out of their villages, lived there. They were um, forbidden to speak the original language. Mm. They had to learn whatever the colonizer's language was because they knew if we take away your language, you have no way of reconnecting back to your village Mm -hmm. you will not know who you truly are and we will control you wow and that's why in this country they do the same thing we are not taught any of our indigenous we're not even taught the truth about our original cultures i used to think that social studies and history was boring and it wasn't until i was an adult to realize it was boring because it was sanitized Mm. it was nothing about me that was reflected in it. 
And what little there was made me feel like the, like nobody. When I was growing up, we had Black History Week. It wasn't even a month, not to, you know, and even at that, it's the shortest month. But when I was growing up back in the 60s, it was a week. And during that week, it was very confusing to me because we learned about slavery in the South. My, my grandparents are from the Caribbean. Mm. And then they would describe what black people look like. I didn't quite fit the description. Mm. So now the white kids and the black kids are looking at me like I must come from Mars or something because, well, my hair didn't fit the description. Yeah. In, you know, so they're like, well, you. Oh, you're mixed. Well, that was the thing. It was like, it's like, well, my parents, you know, they both identify as black. And they said, well, you, you know, so then we'd be beat up because we're trying to pass for black. We ain't white. You know, like, who are we? I know recently Mariah Carey wrote a book about that where you just don't fit anywhere. Yeah. Because there's these pigeonholes and how there's a lot of children, actually, but everybody tends to suffer in silence because, again, it's, it's a shame of just not fitting in. Yeah. And it's the same thing like when you were sharing being put into special ed, because, well, you're not from here. So, you know, there's something wrong with you. So now you're going to be punished because there's something wrong with you. And what does that do with your sense of self-confidence? What does that do with your sense of self? Mm -hmm. How does that allow you to then? And that's also why you have this pipeline to prison, because if you notice, when we were growing up, we didn't have all these tests in the second grade, sixth grade, and what have you. Mm -hmm. They did studies to show that if they hold you back in these key grades, there's a higher probability that you're going to drop out of high school because you're a certain number of age of years older than the other kids, mm -hmm. and then you have a higher likelihood of ending up in jail mm. because now you're out of school, where, you know, where are you going to get a job? How are you going to do? So you end up in the wrong element, so to speak. And then it's like, well, there's, again, something wrong with you versus, okay, this has been a mind game setup. My undergraduate um, degree came from Johns Hopkins University. I was a psychology major there. Mm -hmm. And in there, there was all different types of, you know, they're known for research. So as a student there, you were um, – able to participate and, you know, and be aware of a lot of different research that was being there. Mm -hmm. One of the most valuable courses I ever took that was this course called Industrial Psychology. And in it, it showed how it used the media, even the way it sets up projects and what have you, to perpetuate violence, to perpetuate a low sense of self, and to control your mind by the way they do subliminals in advertisements, commercials on TV. And back then, you know, I'm eight, dating myself, but back then we didn't have computers and phones and everything. But I can see how that's just intensified it because yeah. we are experiential people. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing with parents is telling them, do not use TV and technology as babysitters for your children. It's very convenient. But then when you wonder, where'd my child get that from? Why is he acting like what? Because you're allowing artificial intelligence that's been designed by people like the occupant who don't mean you any good to be desensitized to violence, to normalize violence. So in their mind, if I shoot you, I hit reset and you come back and they don't understand the, the permanency of that. Yeah. And a whole host of other things. So, you know, when you speak about vibrations and what have you, it's like, yes, thoughts are vibrations. Yes. So when you're being programmed that way, mm -hmm. it's now this they talked about in Super Size Me, they talked about how with fast foods that, yeah. that are put in our neighborhoods that are food deserts because there's no nutrition, they mm -hmm. use aromatherapy by making everything smell like a particular type of, um, of French fry that they've researched to make that know that particular scent will yeah. make you salivate and crave them. Mm -hmm. Which is why also when you go to the counter, if you haven't ordered French fries, they'll say, you want fries with that? Because they've already programmed and set you up that the likelihood of you saying, oh, yeah, is already there. Wow. You know, our kids are medicated for being attention deficit. That's true. Because they are weaned on sugar and salt, all the things to agitate their nervous system. Yes. Not to mention that where they live, 
are also nature deserts mm -hmm. because when you're in the urban inner city, how much green grass and trees and fresh air do you have? Most of the time you're by some type of a major highway. Yes. You're oxygen deprived because you're inhaling more carbon monoxide than oxygen. Uh, and then again, there's something wrong with you and we need to medicate you. Mm. I had more children back in the day. Blue juice was a real big thing. Mm -hmm. They'd have their medication with blue juice. And I said, well, maybe if you had um, designer water, like filtered water or something, yeah. instead of blue juice that turns your, blue, your tongue um, neon blue, you might not need that so much. And that was a, a, like a trend, like, you know, pouring out your tongue, hey, blue, yay, you know, exactly. made it fun. And meanwhile, not realizing all those chemicals that made your tongue look fun, what mm -hmm. was it doing to your brains? And now you're being medicated because you're you're poisoning yourself. And they go, oh, well, you're never going to eat anything healthy. Well, it's all in presentation. I got kids to eat all type of healthy stuff because I'd rename it. Water wasn't water. It was designer water. Oh, wow, that, you know, that's that special. That's like my, my mother's designer pocketbook or something. Mm -hmm. You know, telling them that bananas had sugar spots on it since they like sugar. Yeah. yeah. But it's that really good, high quality sugar. Oh, now everybody was fighting over the bananas in the cafeteria. They were stuffing mm -hmm. it in there for later because, again, it's presentation. One time I had a group of boys in middle school fight over grapefruits because I told them that you had to be mature to eat grapefruits and that they weren't mature enough because they weren't doing the schoolwork or the homework. So they had to prove mm -hmm. to me to earn these grapefruits. And they, I mean, they were like in seventh heaven. They, they did all their work, and they earned these grapefruits. You know, but they so, said, no, so, kids don't like it. So what you think is fair to say, like, because, you know, children are put out there, right? I think the first big, like, like entry to the world besides your birth, right, coming into this existence, um, that, that next big, like, whoa, what's going on is when they go into school. You know, when they go into school and when we're going into school and we haven't been like prepared, right? We haven't been prepared. So it's like easy for us to just go in and just feel very overwhelmed, very tiny. Um, and then easily feel like you go there, you go there, you go there, you go there. And like not having that proper guidance. That's why I think parents, especially parents need to need to hear these things that you're talking about yes because at ultimately we already know that this is how the system is with school this is how it's going to be for a very long time um but if parents are not allowing themselves to be aware of these things you are pretty much feeding your child but to you see, but you see what people don't look at is especially when you come from um, out other countries coming here First of all, there's a higher sense of respect and regard yeah. in other places. Yeah. So that you're assuming that, okay, you know, but also sometimes a lot of that times, you could trust the teacher if you could trust. That's what well, you that's mean. Right, the, but the other challenge that's is that a lot of times you have parents who are not educated themselves. Mm -hmm. So they feel intimidated yeah. going into the school because, well, what do I know? Or you have the opposite where the best defense is an defense, so they come in and curse out the teacher, curse out the principal. Either way, you're not creating communication. And also because there's so much politics, and it's not just the education, hospital, any system that you do, but because you need to have a venue to help educate and empower parents Mm -hmm. so that they know what their rights are. Most parents don't even know what their rights truly are if their child is being evaluated. So yeah. some of them say no, and the child really does need it because the system is broken, but because of it, the child does need it. But to, to know how to advocate, to know what the roles are, to find people in the community. I've had times where if I've had neighbors or friends ask me to come with them for um, when their child is being evaluated, because they know I know the system. Okay, and but you, you you are you you are right. Especially, I like what you just said right now too. You know, parents do have this. Most parents, um, especially immigrants, those that that are just coming into into understanding what it is to live out here, um, they do have this thing like 
that they just trust, you know, like the teacher. Because I know back home in my country, even when a teacher is not teaching, even when she's not at work, she is still called a professor, una profesora, the professor. Like the students still like, hi, professor, hi, professor, hi, professor. Professora, you know, and even like teachers, like disciplining, like parents just felt this trust. Like if your teacher had to discipline you or had to put you on timeout or had to kind of show you the ruler, <laughs> we're not talking about abuse here, but had to show you the ruler, at least parents felt like you, the child needed some sense of discipline, you know? And it's like now it's, it's different out here. It's different out here. But you see, the challenge is that out of the fair, that sometimes you're, you're not assertive enough or sometimes you are too aggressive. And either way you become disempowered because if you're considered a troubled parent, you know, a problem parent where you're cursing out and screaming and yelling at, they know how to do that. You know, okay, you, you know, you're just going to be banned from the school mm -hmm. or, you know, you're just not heard. But when you take the time to find out, because every school has people that are for you as well as against you. So in exploring it through word of mouth to find out who there is an advocate for me and my child. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be different. It's not based on title. It's who there is about. Because I know at my schools, my whole thing was that I became a social worker to advocate for our community. Mm -hmm. So I didn't care if you were, you know, assigned to me or not. If you were a parent that, you know, I could communicate with and talk to would tell you these, as I said, even within it with my neighbors and stuff, they know that yes, if you want, I will come with you to to the uh, meetings and stuff. I went, you know, just before COVID hit, and they were like, "Oh no, your child just needs." And I was like, "Okay, no, that's." I told myself that's like my adopted niece. Mm -hmm. I said, and because of her speech, she feels like she's no she's nobody, so she needs to have counseling. Mm -hmm. She needs that. She don't have to be thrown in a chair to need counseling. You have to have low self esteem. She has low self esteem. She needs counseling. She needs counseling. And they were like, who are you again? And then one of them recognized my name because I had worked there before. And it was like, oh. Uh -huh. So all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah. So they said, okay, we, we got to, you know, we'll get back to you in a minute. So we were sitting out and they came up, yeah, we're going to give her counseling and we're going to give her. And, and the parents were like, they weren't saying that before. I said, yeah, I'm sure. I had another neighbor. They hadn't even given the child the services that they talked about to begin with. Mm -hmm. And they, they were from Senegal. So the child is all mixed up because, you know, you got the cultural thing at home, but school is totally different. Yeah. You know, and he was precious, but he's a little boy. He's, you know, running all over the place. You know, his parents had just had like a really bad breakup, so he's reacting to it. So they like, oh, he needs special ed. So he was supposed to get extra help. Well, the fact that they don't even speak English at home, they speak their dialect. Yeah, he's a little confused. Mm -hmm. So they hadn't even given him the services that they had said they were going to give him. It's now the middle of October, and they're talking about reevaluating him. So I happened to run into her when she was on the way to the school. I said, no, I'll go with you. So I went, and I'm like, okay, so it's the middle of October, yeah. and you're saying it's not working out, but he hasn't even, you haven't even tried that service yet. Mm. And they're looking at me like, I said, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. And they're like, who are you? Wow. And because I've always been known to be speaking out, everybody knows my name. So, <laughs> um, yeah. And they were like, oh, you're who? <laughs> oh, oh. So all of a sudden it went from the teacher couldn't be disturbed to, um, um we're going to get somebody to cover her class so she could, you know. Yeah. And they was like, yeah, they weren't doing all that before. I don't know, I'm sure they were. Principal's hiding out in her office. She's too busy, but she sends out the parent coordinator. So now we've had a nice little convo, and it's like yeah. he, he needs, yeah, and he's going to get it like this afternoon, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, but I tell parents all the time that there, you know, there are people in schools, but you've got to, you know, through word of mouth, through the yeah. PTA, through the parent to see who are the players and who is in your corner. Yeah. And also what's also good is that online these days, um, like in the city, you've got, you know, New York City Department of Ed, there are mm -hmm. websites. 
and from okay. there you can see who's who in the schools. Okay. But you can also see, okay, what are your rights? Because there's also what's called the parent advocacy group. Mm -hmm. And their job also is to help educate and empower. Yeah. But also for parents, a lot of times there are adult ed classes so mm -hmm. that if your English is not up to speed or if your schooling is not up to f speed and you're feeling intimidated, these things that help to give you a better sense of confidence. I had one parent one time, you know, she hadn't finished high school and her child was acting out, you know, and I was the counselor. Mm -hmm. and, and as I spoke to her, I said, you know, you have a right every year. I don't know if it's true now, but it was back in the 80s mm -hmm. to see your child's records to see what's in it, to make sure there's nothing in there that shouldn't be in it, and for them to explain it to you. And she was like, really? I don't even know what they're talking about. So, so I'll give you an overview. Mm. I was so proud of her. We went through it. We did a role play in the whole bit. Yeah. And um, and I brought her over to the office, and I said, you know, Miss So-and-so would like to make an appointment to see her son's records. And she just like, that's right. Yeah, I want to see my son's record. <laughs> that's she right. came in that day. I mean, I was near tears. I was so proud of her because she went from this, well, whatever they say, and I'm sorry, my child. So that's right. I have a right to see it, and I'm his advocate. And it shifted the way her son was in school. Because mm. in her shifting and having a sense of herself, it made him feel more secure. Yes. And he began to act differently. Because yeah. now he felt safe. Because as you said, a lot of times the children come into a school and you got all these big people and all these yeah. whatever, and they're talking over you and at you and stuff, and you're scared to death, and your parents, you know, are like, don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So now you're really overwhelmed. But when you feel like you have a support, where you have people that are listening to you, that are there to advocate, that believe in you. Like yeah. all my students knew, look, I know all of you are smart and have your own skills. So I expect greatness in all of you. That's right. If you have, if you need, if you're having a problem with something, you tell me and I will be your best advocate. But do not embarrass us. You go through a chair or something in there, I'm going to be sitting with you in class to teach you how to act in the classroom. Because, because you, and you see everything that you're sharing, you're not, you're not, it's not that, it's not about like, you also saying, you know, you do need discipline, right? You you still need that love. You still need that support. You still need that guidance. But at the end of the day, you know, um, it boils down to also knowing that you have that support, knowing who's on your corner, who can support you, you know? Um, I had like two situations that I can recall. Um, one, when I was an investigator for Children's Services, um, I had this one child, her parents was, um, were, they came from Central America, so they didn't know any, any English. Um, so they placed the child in special ed. They placed her in, in the special ed system, saying that she was very delayed. This little girl was about, I believe, nine years old. She bust her behind to get herself out of the special ed system. She studied, she did a lot of things. So the way this case got called in was um, the little girl was disciplining her brother. <laughs> <laughs> her brother wasn't listening. So she, her mom didn't, don't know English. Her father neither. All they do is work and come back home. The mom would stay home, but the mom taught the little girl how to cook, how to clean. So the teacher decided to call in the case because the girl was cooking and cleaning and she was only nine years old. And the teach and the teacher felt that she was too young to be cooking and cleaning. I was, I even said to her, I said, didn't this girl get herself out of special ed? And she was like, yes. Um, but she's hitting her brother, which, you know, I did talk with her. I said, don't, don't be playing, don't place your hand on him, okay? But she did tell me, it's because I want him to be studious. I want him to learn. I want him to know that he can I'm go. I'm disciplining him. I'm not being so <laughs> sensitive to him. Exactly. <laughs> But I had to come to her defense too, you know, and I had to tell the teacher, I said, okay, so let this young lady, do you, you have children? She said, yeah, I have a son. I said, okay, so now your son is all grown. And let's say, who knows, he, he comes across with another young lady in his life, right? And now they're married, but she don't know how to cook and clean. Who, come on. So the mom is only teaching her to prepare her for when she becomes independent and go out. It's life. It's life skills. It's like, 
How are they supposed to? I've had more young people now, oh, I don't cook. I order in all the time. And it's like, um, first of all, it's kind of expensive. And also, if you're not cooking yourself, most places you're not even getting real food. Mm -hmm. Without real food, it's not real nutrition. And then you blame it on age versus poor nutrition. Yeah. And as you said, you know, when it comes to the kids, there's got to be a balance of discipline with consistency. Yeah support, and most important, that that child has to know that you care about them, that you love them, and that you believe in them. Yes. Because, and that you also realize that they are also human beings. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not beating them to death. They have brains. Yes. I had parents at times that they would say, how come my child listens to you? You can't even hit them. I said, mm -hmm. I don't have to hit them. I keep my word. They know that, okay, if you if you embarrass us in class, I'm going to come sit next to you in class, and we're going to do what I call Classroom 101. Mm -hmm. Together, we're going to be putting the book together, but it also helps me because then I find, okay, you're acting out because on the download, you can't read and you're embarrassed. That's true. So then when I bring you into my office and say, you know, I had a hard time reading growing up too, which is true. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, really? I was like, yeah, these are the tricks I learned. These are the different resources that I had. That You know, you're not the only one you may feel like you are. Mm. And I had other kids who were really smart, but they didn't want to be called nerds. So they would act out trying to fit in. Yeah. And once again, to you know, think, you know, talk to them aside, but to create safe spaces so that you could have those conversations with them. Mm -hmm. So that you're talking with our youth, not yeah. at our youth. Because mm -hmm. so, children are to be seen and not heard. Well, then how do you know how they're feeling, what they're thinking, and what they need? Because a lot of times, you know, it's this magical thinking. Well, if I gave birth, then I just know everything about parenting. Mm -hmm. No, you know how to have sex. That's what you know. And in this day and age, as complex as it is, parenting, I tell everybody, I said it's ironic, the most sacred and important responsibility one could ever have, which is parenting, is the ones that we were the least equipped to do. You got to go for classes and trainings to drive a car. You got to go get degrees to be a teacher, okay. lawyer, or Indian chief. But all you got to do to have a child is have sex. And having sex and giving birth does not make you naturally know how to nurture them, how to care for them, how to raise them. I've had more parents when they say, well, I know what's best because I gave birth to me. But I say, if that was true, you wouldn't have been sent here to see me. It's not rocket science, but if you're not guided, and between the fact that a lot of times we leave where we you know, grew up from another country or wherever, mm -hmm. but we don't have our parents there, or our parents didn't have a clue either. Yeah. So if we knew better, we would do better. Yeah. Because... Back in ancient times, so yeah, you had a cultural rites of passage where the elders would work with the teenagers, the men, mm -hmm. men with the boys, the women with, and they would teach you how to be a, a partner for marriage and a parent for your children yes. and to be a member of the community. But we don't have that any, anymore. Even when they have rites of passages, you know, you learn a little bit about history, stuff, but it's not really preparing you for it's not. life. It's not. It's not. And those things need to be brought back because you also have uh, mothers that are getting depressed because they're beating themselves up saying, I'm a failure as a mother because, you, know, I, I, you know, I don't know what to do. Versus <laughs> the fact that you're not a failure, the system has failed you because if you don't have someone in your life to help guide you and teach you how to do these things, it's not magic where it's supposed to just be naturally part of giving childbirth. <laughs> it's a wonderful story, but it's not true. This is this is why I say it's so important to 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 get your mind right. Get your mind right. It's truly yours. Your brain is yours. We have literally given up on ourselves in in ways that I can't like it hurts me just to even talk about it. But we have we have truly allowed, you know, everything that's been thrown at us to be it, to be the truth you know, and not giving our brain credit. Could we, like really surrounding yourself with the with the right vibrations, right? It takes you getting yourself right. That's number one. That's number one, you know? It's not even like, oh, I'm trying to get the right people around me. I'm having a hard time with that. It's because we haven't tapped into this. Right. We haven't tapped into this. We don't even know how to use this. 
You know, and we, there was a time that we were trained how to use this, right. how to silence ourselves, how to go inside, how not to be afraid to go inside your home. This is your home. And if you can know, like, if you really truly know that, you will go back inside. But we've been like, okay, everyone outside, everyone outside thinking that everything outside is, is where we need to go, right? Our journey is not outside of us. The journey is within us. And I think the fact that you've been able to journey, go into this journey of self, you know, of knowing thyself, going within yourself, I think that this gave you a lot of confidence to be able to speak out for these parents, for these children, you know? And even other people will probably see you as as being a rebel, like, oh, why she's why she's always why she's always you know, getting in there. But the truth is, you know thyself. You know, you have a sense of our, of very rooted with history, with like the original state of being. And I think that that gave you so much confidence. And this is why I say parents to this day, like even with me knowing how to do numerology and studying it now and, and just be more, I, I really take take the time to dissect the numbers. You know, I even meditate before I even give you your numbers because I want to make sure that this is this is in alignment to what you need, what you need to know, right? I had a parent, a few parents. Um, I did all my nieces. <laughs> I did all my siblings, right? I also did um, some of my, some people that have been reaching out to me one was having such a hard time with her child and were thinking that she fell as a parent, right? Didn't understand these vibrations. And yes, her child had big energy, mm -hmm. right? It is true. And her vibrations are, is the whole different ball game. So of course her and her daughter will go like this a lot. Mm -hmm. But when she got to understand, wow, her daughter vibration was, was exactly what she needed. Was right. like that balance for her, but she didn't know how to like guide her daughter. And so after we did her numbers, her she said it was like day and night. The house energy in the home was like day and night. She's still working on some things, but then she said she remembers her numbers. <laughs> so she said, exactly. She said, okay, this is this is what Matthew Tatiana said that I should use um, these basic tools for myself but you know what the amazing thing is that i gave her tools yes her tools because the thing is like many times we feel like okay let me give you tools for you can raise your child right how about if you are the factor that's causing the racket <laughs> well that's the thing is that it's like with the, when I always give the example in the airplane, you got to give yourself oxygen before you can give them to your children. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. You, your children can't heal beyond you. Mm -hmm. As you're healing yourself, it helps to rebalance and sets the tone. Yes. It creates a healing environment for the children. It's a lot safer to scapegoat the kids. Oh, I don't know what their problem is. Something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. But it's like, and I always tell parents children are symptoms of a larger problem it's like if it, it's like them being the runny nose mm -hmm. and okay so we keep getting them with tissues but we never deal with the fact that you have a cold and okay you need some some golden seal or whatever to help your cold mm -hmm. and then once you finish your cold they'll be fine because you're not sniffling on them anymore mm -hmm. You know, that's why I said in terms of parenting, if you've never learned to be a parent and just decide, well, you must know because you gave birth, mm -hmm. and then when your children are acting up, it's not a con condemnation on you, but it's a symptom to let you know, okay, this is not working. That's right. And there's no shame in your game of if that's not working to seek guidance and help from, you know, elders that, you know, are aware. You know, not to somebody who's old, because they might, you know, not have, but someone that you know knows about children. And to get the guidance, to get the feedback, because a lot of times we're acting out what didn't go right with us. Mm -hmm. You know, if our parents are beating on us or cursing us out or feeding us junk food all the time and stuff, that's what we're going to do with our kids, because that's all we know. That's right. 
And we also are trying to fulfill the void that we have. So as we're going through, because that's why even in the schools, most of the time, even though tech now is just supposed to work with the child, I would do a lot of reach out with parents and try to do as much work with the parents as possible. Mm. Because I knew I'm only going to be able to help the child as much as I'm helping the parent. Yes. Because they're going home to the parents all the time. And parents aren't these bad guys. They're mm -hmm. just letting you know they're human too. They need support. They need guidance. A lot of times I had mothers that needed mothering mm -hmm. because they never had it. And we're hoping that, you know, sometimes I forget children don't stay cute little baby dolls forever. They're not dolls. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of times you end up having a lot of them because you keep looking for that original innocent love. Mm -hmm. it, you can't get from having children. It's something that you need help in healing mm -hmm. within right. yourself so that you learn how to love yourself. That's right. And your children can't love themselves when you don't love yourself because they're a reflection of you. That's right. So as you're going for your own healing and your own support and to acknowledge the fact that, yes, it takes, it takes a certain inner strength, yes. a certain humbleness mm -hmm. to do that. But if you really care and want to do better for your children, you have got to do that for yourself as well. Mm -hmm. And that there's a power in that. Because as we know historically, as you were saying before, between the colonizations of Africa, of the Caribbean, Central America, of all these places, mm -hmm. there are traumas that are being handed down from generation to generation. You know, they call it epigenetics. They have... Um, strategies such as family constellations and others to really address these traumas that have been handed down. There's a reason why we beat our kids to death. Back in slavery, we were beaten. Mm -hmm. So now you identify with the oppressor, so now you think that's the way to go. So in helping to heal those traumas, and part of it is, is, is connecting the dots yeah. and seeing. That's why it is important also to know your family tree, your family history. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times it's not until you get geriatric like me do you even think to want to know about it, and then everybody's dead, and then what do you do? And Ancestry.com and all of them are nice, but it's even better when you're able to get it from the source and find yeah. out talking to grandma and stuff, what was it like when you were growing up? What were your parents like? How did they meet? What were they like as people? Because from those stories, and also to find out what stories are they not telling. I know even in my own family, there are stories that I wonder about, but there's stories that happen in my generation that I know the following generations have no clue about. At all. And At all. if I try to bring it up, it's, oh, I wonder why are you going to try to talk bad about the dead? Oh, why are you going to, yeah. And that's like, it's going to affect them even if they don't know what it is. Yeah. Part of the healing, so it's not handed down again. Because for this to have happened even in our generation, tell us something <laughs> happened before that we don't know about. But at least in knowing this part and sharing it allows them to be healed from it. Mm -hmm. So they don't have to replay it. But because we've all, you know, you've heard the thing, don't air your, your dirty laundry. It's like, well, you don't have to do it in the general public. Yeah, exactly. But in doing it within a safe therapeutic environment, you know, in, a, in, a, in an environment with people who are trained in that, mm -hmm. that's where the real gift is. Because in healing those traumas, it now gives you a, a better set of tools to feel yeah. empowered, to have a sense of self. So now you're growing forward in the following generations and within your own life mm -hmm. than just trying to get by. Agree. Wow. Wow. Uh, you know what? I think that we gave a lot in just this one clip. Oh my God! I think, I think we just overfed. <laughs> but we're gonna definitely give more and more because this is definitely the time to really get back to you know structuring things, creating that found, that strong foundation again. You guys know that this is the year of the vibrational four. Okay. 22 4 so it's really big energy this makes sense that this is the the year that things have been the way they they've been being teared apart um and also being pushed aside in the moment of time for us to realign ourselves and really get into this space of knowing thyself you know i think this this pandemic time led us to 
really discovering thyself. So if you weren't doing it, <laughs> by force, the world's like, do it, please. Because um, as the new year comes, you know, we, we approach in the new year, we want to be able to do better. We want to be able to, when, when the school starts opening, you know, knowing how, what, what we can say, what we can do, our choices are, I think, is so important. But when we send our kids back to school, we can, we can advocate better. We're more confident, you know. And taking the time to really understand your child's vibrations, I think, is so important. And for you to understand yours, understand what numbers am I? What numbers do I carry? You know, um, and how can I find out about this, right? How can I find out more about my vibrations, about my child vibration? Um, you guys know that I am an open book. You guys can leave your questions below. Um, Nefakara and myself are open. I'm going to place an email address below also that you guys can ask your questions, whether it's for me or whether it's for Nefakara. And I will make sure that we answer you as soon as we can, as soon as we can. But it was such a pleasure to, to come together. And I cannot wait for all the gems we are going to like blah, put out here. Do you want to say any final words to everyone? Well, I just want to thank everybody for your time and your interest. I want to thank you, Master Tatiana, for having me on the show. It's been a real pleasure. And I pray that um, the information that we've shared have been very empowering and has given some hope during this time of so much going on. I wish you all a, a great day and looking forward to next time. Bye, everyone. <laughs>